hello hello to everyone again today we have just a little bit more light than yesterday so our days are getting longer a little bit at a time each day so we're going to be online for the next little while until we have a, a better idea of where our city is and as we enter into this final weekend of this year i like for us to listen to the teachings of shane claiborne so i'm still here this week I just want to bring another teacher to learn from. And I just love listening to Shane because he's like, he's like a modern day monastic. And some of you may have come across his name and maybe even read some of his books. And he is a radical follower of Jesus. So he is a speaker, an author, an activist, and a peacemaker. And his mentor is none other than Dr. Tony Campolo. So you probably have an idea where his passions are. And together, they had headed up a movement called the Red Letter Christian Movement. The Red Letter Christian Movement. And within evangelical circles, they are seen as kind of unconventional, kind of bit on the edge. And we, we Anabaptists, we have been labeled the OG, the original Red Letter Christians. So what does it mean to be a red letter Christian. Well, let's go to their website to find out. And here there is a pledge. And the pledge is this. I dedicate my life to Jesus and commit to live as if Jesus meant the things he said in the red letters of scripture. I will also I will allow Jesus and his teachings to shape my decisions and priorities. I denounce belief only Christianity and refuse to allow my faith to be a ticket into heaven and an excuse to ignore the suffering world around me. I will seek first the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven and live in a way that moves the world towards God's dream, where the first are last and the last are first, where the poor are blessed and the peacemakers are the children of God working towards a society where all are treated equally and resources shared equitably. I recognize that I will fall short of my attempts to follow Jesus, and I trust in God's grace and the community to catch me when I do. I know that I cannot do this alone, so I commit to share this journey with others who are walking in the way of Jesus. I will surround myself with people who remind me of Jesus, help me become more like him, and to hold me accountable for my actions and words. I will share Jesus with the world, with my words and with my deeds. Like Jesus, I will interrupt injustice and stand up for the life and dignity of all. I will allow my life to point towards Christ everywhere I go. Wow, so there it is. And as you can see, this is serious. It's a serious pledge to be a serious follower of Christ. And it's, it's, it's honest, it's straightforward, and it's clear. And this pretty much summarizes Shane's approach to life and faith. And it sounds kind of radical when you compare it to mainstream Christianity. And, and Shane really, he points us back to Jesus his life, his deeds, and his teachings, and not to be content that we have a ticket to heaven. So in the video, he'll be sharing a little bit about his life, and then you'll see him on stage. And Shane has gained quite a following with the, the younger crowd, the Gen Xers and the Gen Zs. And the younger people today are sharp. The young people, they see through fake faith. They don't want to play this religious game and politics. They just want to follow Jesus. And Shane was inspired to do something very different. He started a inner city mission in Philadelphia called The Simple Way. So they're a small missional community of love and they support neighbors. They help people to, to get food and shelter and feel that they belong. And this work is really genuinely rooted in the love of Christ. And this ministry started when he and a group of his friends, they were in uh, Kingston, 
in that inner city area in Philadelphia, and they saw the suffering there. Dozens and dozens of homeless family, they actually moved into an abandoned Catholic church building. And they were told by the archdiocese that they had 48 hours to move out or they could be arrested. Well, they had nowhere to go. So these courageous moms and children, they hung a banner in front of the building and they said, how can people worship on Sunday and ignore us on Monday? And they prayed. They prayed and they said that God, the real owner of this building, said that we could stay until we find somewhere else to go. And this is kind of how the simple way began. So Shane, he's a passionate Christian. I heard him a couple of years ago when he spoke at Tyndale, and at that time he didn't cut his hair yet, and he was wearing the same baggy pants and shirt which he stitched by his, with his own hands. And he's authored many, many books, a half dozen books, and probably his most well-known one is uh, the, is called Irresistible Revolution. And in his teaching today, he was addressing college students in Urbana 09. And when you listen to him, sometimes it feels like he's going everywhere and he's talking about a bunch of issues, but basically he's talking about what it means to be kingdom citizens. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And he always challenges the status quo and he wants every Christian to take the example of Jesus and to follow his way of serving, caring, and bringing justice to this world. So enjoy his teaching today, and I will see you all on Sunday. Blessings to you. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was sick, did you take care of me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was homeless, did you bring me in? If we find ourselves climbing the ladder of success, we better be careful. Because on our way up, we might pass Jesus on His way down. Because I saw Jesus, one that was coming to call us into the pain and the suffering of the world. And, and so I wanted that kind of faith. I wanted a faith that like got into the pain of the world. I grew up down in Tennessee, in you know, what a lot of us call the Bible Belt. Some of us even said Tennessee might be the buckle of it. And I was r real, real uh, good kid. I, I, I made straight A's and uh, wore nice clothes and I was prom king. It was a small town and uh, uh, I can remember growing up in, in the church and hearing about how God loved me and, and I, I'm so thankful that I, unlike, I mean not everybody has that experience but I had the experience of growing up in the church that people loved me well and I began to understand that uh, there's a God that loves me and, and loves the whole world. And I saw Southern hospitality. I had a mom and grandparents that just took such good care of people. And um, my dad died when I was a kid, but I, I learned um, to love for my family. I was an only child and an only grandchild. So some might argue that I was a little spoiled, but I, uh, I, I definitely felt loved. And that helped me, I think, to, to receive uh, this message that there's a God that loves me and I can remember going on a little retreat uh, with my youth group and they gave an altar call for us to kind of give our lives at the altar to God and dedicate them to God and, uh, and I did it you know tears rolling down my face and everything and then uh, the next summer we went again and uh, we did it again. It was so good the first time. I, 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 we got born again, again every year, like every summer we'd go. And then there kind of came a point where we said, there's got to be more to this thing than just getting born again, again every year. And there, there's got to be more than just believing in Jesus. Because um, as I started reading the scripture, I got the sense that Jesus didn't just come to make believers, but to form disciples. And I, and I saw that we can believe in Jesus and, and still not have our lives change or look much different. And, and, and uh, so I, as I started reading the words of Jesus, like the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, it started to mess with me. I mean, I, I, I saw the things that I was running after and, and they weren't always the same things that I saw Jesus uh, telling us to do. And, and so there kind of came a moment where I felt this kind of collision in me. And I, 
There's people out there, you know, that tell me all the time, uh, my life was such a mess, and then I met Jesus, and everything came together. I'm like, God bless you. For me, I pretty much had my life together, and I met Jesus, and He messed me up. And, and I've been kind of recovering from that ever since, because I saw Jesus saying, if you want to be the greatest, then you should become the least. I started wondering why I was working so hard to be the greatest. I went to college outside of Philly, and... Uh, I guess, you know, when you're, when you're in college and you're young or you're in high school and you're young, like you haven't been convinced that things are impossible, which is a gift. And that was our case. We thought, we want to learn how to follow Jesus. Who's really doing it? And uh, Mother Teresa was still alive at the time, and she seemed to be giving the old, you know, this gospel way of life a pretty good shot. So we wrote her a letter and ended up calling her on the phone. She picked up the phone. We said, we want to come to India. And so bam, bam, before long, we were in Calcutta and working alongside of Mother Teresa and the sisters. And one of the things that I learned is this incredible reality that we are to be the body of Christ. That, you know, I'd heard a lot of language that, that oh, we're the body of Christ, that's where the church is or whatever. But when, it, when I was in India, I, I learned about that in a way that was so beautiful because um, in the mornings, every morning we would get up really early and we would kneel down before the cross, but we would pray these prayers that were about Jesus living in us and through us, that our hands would become Christ's hands. And you had this real sense that, uh, that th these sisters believed that, that they were going to be an extension of Jesus' love in the world. It's beautiful to be together. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about the good news a little bit, but first you have to talk about the bad news sometimes. You know, before we get to the one that we serve, we have to talk about the one we don't serve. So tonight we talk about money. And you know, statistics, they can be kind of tricky, sort of like doctrines. They're important, but they're hard things to love and they're hard things to capture our imagination. So I want to help you just a little bit tonight as we get started. This is a little one pound bag of rice. But you know, you, you may see these every once in a while, and I want to use it tonight to remind us that in this bag of rice, there's about 24,000 little grains of rice, almost equivalent to the number of lives that are lost every day from poverty and suffering. And every one of those matters to God. And as we saw, saw some of the statistics of inequity in the world, I think it's also important to remember, as St. Francis said, that the more stuff we have, the more clubs we have to have to protect it. So one more image. Imagine with me that this grain of rice represents the Hiroshima bomb where about a hundred, over a hundred thousand people died with that one blast. And then I'll pour out the amount of nuclear weapons that the United States now has if every grain of rice represented a Hiroshima bomb. This is 90 grains of rice, what it would take to blow up all of Russia. And this is what we now have, 122,000 Hiroshima bombs. Our Savior wept over Jerusalem because it didn't know the things that bring for peace. 
And don't you think that our lover Jesus is weeping over our world today in the mess that we've made. And yet, I'm excited to be alive today because I think there's a new thing stirring in the world. Amen? I believe that there's a generation in the church that is convinced that our faith is not just about going up when we die, but about bringing God's kingdom down. Amen? And I love it because when you read Scripture, you get the sense that God is forming a people that are to be a light in this world, that are to, to show the world what a society of love looks like. And so the scripture begins with this beautiful story in Exodus of God hearing the pain, the groaning of a slave people and leading them out of their slavery. But then God begins, of course, to mark them as a little holy counterculture. They're to be a little different. And they're to have things like jubilee to make sure that debt is released and slaves are set free and that the land can rest. And it's almost as if God is saying, if you don't do these things, you're going to end up like the empire again. You're to be a different kind of people. And one of the first things that we have in Scripture is the story of the people in the wilderness getting hungry. And so they begin to groan to God. And God pours out manna from heaven, this beautiful abundance that just kind of comes out of the heavens. And yet the first command that they're given, even before the Ten Commandments, is don't take more than you need for this day. We're to pray this day our daily bread. And God even says, if you take two days rations, I'm going to send some maggots to eat it up. And, and, and they are to take one omer, one day's ration with them in the Ark of the Covenant to remind them that God will provide each day their daily bread. They don't need to take more than they need. As Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need, but there's not enough for everyone's greed. God has not created an economy where there's too many people or too little stuff. But we've created poverty because we haven't figured out how to live into this command of loving our neighbor as ourself. Amen? And that's what I love about Jesus. Because he comes and teaches us this shrewdness with money, right? I mean, first of all, he's like, Judas take the cash, brother. You know, and we see how that went. But you know, at, at another point, the, the tax collectors come. He's always so creative with money. The tax collectors come and they say, do you pay your taxes? And, and Jesus tells them to go get a fish and it'll have a four drachma coin in its mouth. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, fish don't usually have coins in their mouth, you know? And, and I think he's kind of saying, Oh, Caesar can have his coins, but I made the fish. What? You know, and as, as one of the saints says, once we've given to God what's God's, there's not a whole lot left for Caesar. That we're talking about serving God, not money. And we see that in Jesus. His stories have so much to do with the world around him, you know? I mean, he talks about the real stuff of his world, about uh, widows and orphans and wages and day laborers. And uh, one of the great stories, you know, uh, where they bring the, the laborers in and they, some of them work three hours, some work all day, some work one hour, and they're all given the same wage. You read that and you're like, that doesn't seem fair. But I think what God's teaching us is that God's justice doesn't always look fair, but it is always good. And this world is unfair, and God has come to set some things right again, to take the mighty from their thrones and to lift up the lowly, to fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty, that our God is a God that is of an upside-down kingdom. And I, I began to discover that in Tennessee uh, as I was growing up. And I, you know, one of the great stories, one of my, my favorite money stories of Jesus is in Luke 16, where it talks about the shrewd manager, you know, who's, uh, I, this is one you don't ever hear preach. So read it tonight. Luke 16, great story, good bedtime story. You know, this shrewd manager begins to find himself stuck in a tough position and he's uh, going to have to make a, an account to the big boss, you know, and so, uh, he brings in the debtors, and he, he's just sort of like, okay, uh, well, what do you owe? And uh, uh, some of them owe 800 gallons of oil, and he's like, uh, 
cut it in half. How's that sound? You know, and then another comes in, a thousand bushels of weed. He's like, make it 800. And it's kind of like, this is the different bailout plan. God is bailing out the little man, not the big man, you know. And, and it's that which creates, I'm sure, this little grassroot revolution, you know. And, and then I'm, at some point, I'm sure the big boss comes into town and finds out what happened, you know. And he's left with a tough decision. He can either be like, no, my manager was wrong. You all owe me money. That would have been pretty disastrous, I think, right? Uh, or he could say, kind of pull that manager aside and be like, you dirty little devil. Good job. Don't do it again. You know, uh, but, but I, and, and, and the end of the story is that the, 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 the folks that loved money hated him, that they began to plot against Jesus. And I think what Jesus is teaching us is that if the people of this world, this isn't exactly an ethics story, but he's saying if the people of this world can be that creative, how much more creative should we be in the kingdom of God? If the credit card companies can be so creative to get people in debt, why can't we liberate the captives, amen? And it's that imagination which we are invited into because we are God's counterculture. We are not to conform to the patterns of Wall Street, but the patterns of the upside down kingdom of God. And in 1965, the average worker in the US was making about seven and a half dollars an hour. The average CEO was making about $330 an hour. That same study was just done again. And the average worker wage is almost exactly the same, seven and a half dollars an hour and the average executive is making over $1,500 an hour. What's so exciting is the world's starting to go, I'm not sure the world can afford that dream. Maybe God has a different dream than the American dream or the Canadian dream. Maybe God has a different dream in mind that is actually going to set the, the, the oppressed free. And it's that imagination that we are invited into not to conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. As I learned that. One of the people that's taught me that was Mother Teresa because she caught that, that, that imagination, you know, and I worked with her in Calcutta, and sometimes people were like, oh, you met Mother Teresa, did she shine? You know, I'm like, no, I mean, sister wasn't a nightlight, you know, she was just sort of this little old lady, just precious, so, you know, you wanted to just squeeze her, but not break her, if you know what I'm saying, and, but there's one thing that I will never forget about Mother Teresa, and that is her feet. You see, Mother Teresa's feet were terribly deformed. I noticed because every morning we would go to worship together and we would take off our shoes and socks and go in barefoot. It was how uh, the Christian culture prayed in India. And I noticed that her feet were deformed. And I wondered if she had caught leprosy or something. You know, of course, I wasn't about to ask her, Mother Teresa, what's up with that? You know, I mean, this is Mother Teresa. <laughs> but one day, one of the sisters came up to me and she said, have you noticed her feet? And I said, yes, I have. And she said, her feet are deformed because we get just enough shoes donated for everyone to get a pair. And Mother Teresa doesn't want someone to have a worse pair of shoes than she has. So she digs through all of the donations and she picks out the worst pair of shoes and she takes them for herself. And after wearing the worst pair of shoes decade after decade, it's deformed her feet. Don't you wonder what the world would look like if we really took that idea of loving our neighbor as ourself that seriously? Uh, and it wasn't just Mother Teresa that taught me that, but uh, the kids in Calcutta, they, they taught me that too. You know, we, we had these street parties where we would get a bunch of the kids who were beggars on the street together and, and we would throw them parties and we'd blow bubbles and turn flips, you know, and play in the street. And, and this one kid came up to me and he told me it was his birthday. And I thought, well, we, we've got to get this kid something, you know. And uh, so I, uh, my mind starts going, and I decide, what better to get him than an ice cream cone? So I, I go and get him an ice cream. It's like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, you know. So I get him this ice cream, and he gets it, and his instinct is he, he looks at it, and he just shakes. He's so excited. He's like, oh, gosh, you know. <laughs> and then his instinct is, this is too good to keep for myself. 
So he yells at all the other kids and he goes, we've got ice cream. He yells at all of them. He says, come over, everybody gets a lick. He goes down the line, he's like, your turn, your turn. Like full circle all the way back to me. And he's like, Shane, you get a lick too. I got this whole spit phobia thing going, you know, but I, I kind of fake a lick. And, uh, uh. But that kid knew the secret. He knew the secret that Mother Teresa knew, that the best things to do with the best thing in life is to give it away, not to keep it for ourselves. The blessings of God are too good to keep for ourselves. And it flies in the face of so much that we see in our culture and even in the church with this self-centered, blessing-obsessed gospel of prosperity that's about us and finding your best life and becoming a better you. And if we're not careful, we lose the secret of Jesus, which is if you want to find your life, you got to give it away. And if you cannot give away your possessions, then they are not your possessions. You are their possession. If you can't give your iPod away, then you are possessed by that evil iPod. It's time to take a hammer to it. It's time to get rid of it. This is the invitation. And it's an invitation that is not rooted in how bad the stuff is, but how good the world is that God has made, that we don't want to just keep it for ourselves. At one point, someone told Mother Teresa, they said, oh, Mother Teresa, what you do is so noble. I couldn't do what you do for a million dollars. And she said, well, me neither. <laughs> I wouldn't do this for a million dollars, but I would do it for the love of God. I would do it because it's what I'm made for. It's what brings me life, and it's ultimately why we're left here on earth. And dear friends, it is a beautiful time to be alive because I think there is a generation reimagining what our faith looks like, not so that people can see how good we are, but so they can't help but taste how good is our God, how good is our God. And I think we have to be very careful not to get distracted because there's a, a lot of uh, bad theology out there, you know. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of prosperity gospel. There's a lot of gospel about different things. I was on the airplane the other day, and this guy sat down next to me, and he said, you, uh, what do you do? I thought that was kind of a funny question, you know. And I, I said, well, I'm a preacher. And he said, you must, they, they, they must not make preachers like they used to. And I, I, I said, uh, no, pastor, they must not. And he said, well, praise God. And, uh, and we, we got to talking, and he started talking about how this is the apocalypse and stuff, you know. And he said, you must not be short of preaching material these days because this is the apocalypse. And he kept talking, and I, I kind of thought maybe he'd read too many of Tim LaHaye's books, you know. But I, 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 uh, as I listened to him, I thought he was on to something because what he was saying was these are interesting times that we live in. And, and, and the word apocalypse, I thought later, it doesn't just mean everything ends and burns up, but it means revelation, that it comes from the same word as revelation. It's an unveiling, a ripping away the veil, you know, kind of like in the Wizard of Oz where they're like, rip the curtain away and they're like, little old man, who knew? You know, but I, uh, <laughs> people are asking questions about what's underneath the patterns of the world we live in and what's going to give us ultimate fa hope in the world. And it's such a fun time. And one of the last stories of revelation that I want to leave you with is the story of the fall of Babylon. You know, Babylon, this quintessential symbol of empire and all of the counterfeit splendor of this world. And as Babylon falls, there's two responses. The merchants of the earth, who Revelation says they had grown drunk from the adulteries with Babylon. And as she falls, the merchants and the kings, they weep and they wail and they say, how could Babylon have fallen? And yet there's another response, and that is the angels. The angels in heaven rejoice. And they say, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great whore? This is PG-13 now. But they, and they, they, they rejoice and they say, now our God can be made known that this counterfeit splendor has gone away and the true beauty of God is known. And I think the real question for us as our world frets and wonders is, 
will we be weeping with the merchants or rejoicing with the angels? Because I'm so excited today. My hope does not lie in Wall Street. My Bible does not say God so loved America, but our God so loved the world. Amen? And it is that which we will not put our hope or our faith in anything less than the blood of Jesus. Amen? All other ground is sinking sand. Amen? All other ground is sinking sand. Amen.